Garry Kasparov is one of the world's all-time great chess players. He played a series of matches against an IBM supercomputer called Deep Blue, and in 1997, Deep Blue beat him. Not by a lot, by a pretty narrow margin, but at that point, the world's best chess player was no longer a human being. The story I've heard is that the supercomputer geeks at IBM were looking around for the next challenge after Deep Blue beat Kasparov because computer chess just became uninteresting. And the story goes, one of the IBM executives or managers responsible for thinking about this was in a bar one night and he noticed that everyone in the dining room got up in the middle of dinner, left their half-eaten steaks on their plates, and ran into the bar to watch TV. And he thought some amazing sporting event was going on. It turns out they ran in there to watch Jeopardy because Ken Jennings was in the middle of an amazing run as a Jeopardy champion. He won 73 times in a row, took home more than $3 million, and became kind of a folk hero in America because he really did appear to have been genetically engineered and raised from birth by ninjas to play the game of Jeopardy. And at that point, the story goes, the IBM exec said, I know what our next challenge is. We're going to build the Jeopardy playing supercomputer. <laughs> Welcome everyone to a very special Jeopardy event. This is Watson. I get a phone call and they said, IBM built that computer to beat you at Jeopardy. Would you be up for this? If I'm like, yes, you know, this is like the greatest thing I've ever heard. This is what the future seemed like to me as a kid. You know, robots would be playing on TV game shows, you know? But also, I had like a pretty good idea that I was gonna win. Um, I was a computer programmer before I went on Jeopardy, so I'd taken like artificial intelligence classes at college, and I knew that there was no computer out there that could do what you would have to do to win at Jeopardy. You know, computers are terrible at understanding all language. But Jeopardy clues are, are, are worse than most. They've got double meanings and puns and literary allusions and, and red herrings. You know, there's a lot of dots that have to be connected, you know, a lot of intuition going on. And computers are, are bad at making those kind of leaps. fitting on the hoof of a horse or a card dealing box in a casino. Watson, what is it? Shoot. You are right. You get to pick. Wanted for killing Sir Danvers Carew. Appearance pale and dwarfish. Seems to have a split personality. Who is Hyde? Hyde, yes. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Either one acceptable. You're now in the lead with 1400. Who is Michael Phelps? Yes. Go. What is Event Horizon? Who is Grendel? What is the last judgment? Correct. Go again. You know, I was standing to Watson's right, and Watson actually has a little mechanical thumb, so I can hear this sort of insectoid clicking. <laughs> and as his score mounted, you know, I remember thinking, you know, this is it. You know, it, it, it's sort of like, I sort of felt like, you know, some 80s Detroit auto worker on the assembly line looking at the robot who had replaced him on the welding machine. I thought my job of knowing things was not going to be replaceable by a computer. And yet, here it is, you know? I'm obsolete, and I'm obsolete on national television. So maybe Game Show Contestant is the first information age job to be made obsolete by, by our new computer overlords, but I feel like it's not gonna be the last. This is a jobs report that appeared on the Forbes website, and it's just kind of a vanilla-looking report about corporate earnings. The only thing interesting about it to me is that it was generated entirely by an algorithm. There was no human being involved in producing this or writing it or editing it. The company's called Narrative Science, and what they do is take a body of facts, in other words, all the details of corporate earnings, and they write a prose narrative about it. And if you read these, they are perfectly clean, clear, English prose. Now, only a few years ago, we couldn't do this. If you wanted to have something written, you had to involve a human being in that work. And the consequence that I spend a lot of time thinking about is what are people going to do for a living when their muscle power really isn't valued anymore because we have all kinds of muscle accelerators. 
And then their mental power is not as valued anymore because we have these astonishing digital technologies that can do mental things, cognitive things, that we used to previously require people to do. Very soon we're going to get to a world where, you know, a vast chunk of the American middle class has a job that can be a, form a formerly safe job that can be done by a computer or a robot. What happens to society when hundreds of millions of people have that aimless, rudderless feeling of, uh, you know, I've been replaced by a very small box or a very short shell script. I don't know if there's a solution. The last significant change in the way we educated our kids occurred around 124 years ago. It was the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. Most kids were raised on farms and jobs were plentiful and predictable. Then in 1843, an educator from Massachusetts decides to visit Prussia on his honeymoon where he witnesses a brand new type of education. Up until that time, education primarily consisted of smart people sitting around talking to other smart people. But after the Prussians were embarrassed in the Napoleonic Wars in the 1800s, this Prussian decides to institute a new type of education for every German boy from 7 to 14 years old, which results in a more fit, more organized, more obedient army. Among his many reforms was this idea to divide up instruction according to age, ability, and subject matter. Strange as it seems today, this had never been done before. This idea of teaching math in one room, science in another room, language skills in yet another was totally new. Horace Mann witnesses this new educational model and he's stunned. Inspired by what he sees, he brings these educational ideas back to the U.S. where it captures the attention of these men. Just like the Prussians, who were anxious to develop more obedient troops, these fathers of the Industrial Revolution were desperate to transform our nation of disorganized farm laborers into trained, efficient workers for their factory and assembly line jobs. We divide the day up uh, in high schools into bits of time, you know, into 40 or 50 minute blocks typically, and then we ring bells and people start to shuffle around the building and do something else. That's an organizational device, it's not an educational principle. And it is in, in broad sweeps a system that resembles a factory culture. If you built a factory in upstate New York and another along the Ohio River, you desperately needed these workers to behave similarly, to know the same kinds of things. If high school graduates in Ohio could quote Shakespeare, but students in New York couldn't even write their own name, it was difficult to build a standard set of factories which utilized both sets of workers. That's when it was decided to form a committee called the Committee of Ten. The committee was tasked with coming up with a standard set of subjects every kid should know. Ten university heads in 1890 said, in 11th grade, everyone should learn chemistry. In senior year, everyone should learn physics and that it should be earth science. They came up with this whole trajectory calculus and, and all, a lot of these subjects are great, but these priorities were, were dictated 120 years ago, 124 years ago. Back in 1892, the Committee of Ten designed our nation's curriculum and for the most part, it has not changed. The biggest employer in Baltimore 50 years ago was Bethlehem Steel Company. You could actually drop out of high school 50 years ago, join the steel union, uh, get a perfectly average job, earning a perfectly average wage, which would entitle you to get a perfectly average mortgage, to buy a perfectly average house with a perfectly average yard, to have 2.0 perfectly average kids who would go to a wonderful, perfectly average public school. You could have a perfectly average retirement and have a perfectly average funeral. That is no longer the case. 
The economy that we created over the course of the 20th century was an economy that needed a large number of moderately skilled people who could do the three R's and who could follow pretty simple instructions. As we head deeper into the 21st century, I really don't think that's the case anymore, yet our educational system still seems to be focused on turning out people with that same relatively small set of skills. My fear is that they're heading into a society and an economy and a workforce that doesn't value those skills very much anymore. And I think we need to take a good hard look and figure out what kinds of people, what kinds of skills are demanded in the technologically extraordinary society and economy that we're creating. Over 100 years ago, the United States went from one-room schoolhouses to the robust industrial model we have now. It was a transformation that was nothing short of miraculous. Perhaps it's time for another transformation. Okay, so that really tees up the film. The, I, I hope you get a sense. I mean, I, I didn't direct it, but it is absolutely exceptional. Um, we then, though, go into, there is a, the heart and soul of the film is a story, and it's a story about two students and their teachers and their parents doing something that doesn't look at all like normal school. And so we'll show you here just three and a half minutes of what is really 60 minutes in the film. Our goal with this was to immerse audiences in a different learning experience and let them understand that actually amazing learning is going on in environments that don't look like desk in a row. until maybe four weeks before exhibition, yeah. three weeks? I mean, we knew, we knew that pieces of it were working. Right. And, and even those pieces were impressive. We had to learn about civilizations, the Mayans, the Romans, and the Greeks. And Scott and Mike didn't want to just teach us this. So they came up with this big wheel, which is a big gear, which has a lot of drawings on it. And it's connected to all these other mechanisms, and they each represented our theory. Then they had to, on their own, develop and defend an idea on why they think civilizations rise and fall. So we had to create like a flow chart just explaining what our theory was, and then we got critiques on it, um, and then we created a group one. Another piece is on the mechanical side. They need to take what's already an abstract concept with their theory, and they have to take that and actually physically manifest it. They have some very preliminary metrics they need to use. They know that there's going to be a big wheel turning at a certain RPM. They know how many teeth that is, so they have basically a box to work within, some bounds to work within, and they have to make everything. <laughs> yeah, I can get it. So we have an exhibition that we're preparing for right now, and it'll be tomorrow night, and there will be thousands of people here looking at student work. Uh, students presenting their work, visitors looking at the work, um, students presenting their work to each other. And I think that idea of making work public, that's a missing piece to me in schools in general. For most of you, this is probably the biggest project that you've ever exhibited. A lot of you, it's the first project that you've ever really had a public exhibition of, all right? Cool. We're going to be here. If you need to go, we understand, but we're going to keep working for a few hours. Great. idea of sort of making something and having a public exhibition and having people come look at it and you have that feeling that we all have like how did they do that you really need to understand it and you really need to understand why you need to know this 
skills to be able to complete the project. What astounded me was that while doing the research, my theory could actually fit for pretty much all the civilizations that we study. When kids have that feeling, it's transformative for them. I made this, and everyone's coming to look at it. So, so this, the story itself has lots of twists and turns and lots of suspense. And it, it just is gripping. I and mean, it's almost as though it were written by a Hollywood scriptwriter, but it's real footage from a real classroom. We started with 12 schools, we started with 100 students, these ended up being our leads. What's interesting is when parents, when legislators important, see this, they go from thinking this type of learning is summer camp to thinking it's really deep, profound learning. The next, now here we are, world premiere, but I have to tell you a little story on it, which is, I, one of the people I really wanted to get in our film was Robert Gates, two-time Secretary of Defense. And, and I knew Bob, and I knew what he'd say. And I, I was like a dog on a pork chop. I went after him for about a year trying to convince him to be in the film. And when you're in public policy, there's very little upside in being in a film and concern and downside. And, um, so we finally got through. We filmed him. I flew my film team from California to Williamsburg, Virginia. And, and I, I got to tell Bob last weekend, I saw him two weekends ago, that, that Bob, you ended up on the cutting room floor. So that, <laughs> he's not in the film. Um, <laughs> He's got a low ego. He was pretty relaxed about it. Um, but anyway, this is a short based on, you'll see what he was like, um, and it's a long story for how he did it on the cutting room floor, but this is on. One of the things that comes out in the film as you watch these kids is that not only are they learning specific you know, geometry, trig, history of civilizations, but they're getting really good at what I like to call essential skills, and this is on one of them. I think one of the key experiences in almost everybody's life is failure. And, and it's something that I think particularly a lot of high achieving young people today are not prepared for. The way life works is try things and be willing to risk failure. The way academics and school works don't ever try anything that might fail. Be as risk averse as possible because that's going to result in that one bad grade that could cost you a chance to get into an elite college. Dealing with failure and learning from it is actually one of the most important skills you can have. Chris Argyris was a professor at Harvard and he wrote this beautiful paper called Teaching Smart People to Learn. He did a study where he looked at Harvard Business School grads and HBS grads you know, presumably these are going to be like the next CEOs, the next presidents, like these are the people who are sort of handpicked by Harvard to, you know, run the world at some point. And what he found was 10 to 15 years after graduation, they were almost all middle management. And they never really, or only very rarely, moved beyond middle management. And he wanted to understand why. The people who end up at an institution like that have been academically successful in elementary school, in junior high school and high school. They get into a great college with a great brand where they do really well. They get the top honors. They work at a great company. And then finally, they get into Harvard Business School. And they, in their lives, rarely experience failure. They have succeeded in everything they have ever done. They've gotten all A's. For them, a B is a catastrophe. And what happens is you then get out into the real world, and you work and work and work. And inevitably, all of us experience failure. But people who have a pattern of consistent success because they don't experience failure don't know how to learn from it. And what Chris found was that when successful people fail, their ability to learn shuts down at precisely the moment they need it most. They commit what's called the fundamental attribution error. They say like, well, you know, I didn't mess up, the market moved. I didn't get the resources I needed. My boss screwed me over, right? It wasn't about me, it wasn't my fault. And so they don't learn from that failure. And the effect he found was they end up as middle managers. And that's not a bad thing, like you live happily ever after. But there's this huge missed opportunity because they weren't learning from failure. That's what actually builds grit. It builds perseverance, it builds resourcefulness, it builds um, a growth uh, mindset. Uh, and it's what allows people to be successful when they get out of the artificial system we call school. So learning from failure, learning that it's okay, and learning that you know, it's the only way to get better, 
is to take risks and fail is an absolutely integral skill. And somehow getting through especially to our highest achieving young people who are totally unaccustomed to failure and therefore I think more likely to react badly when they fail for the first time and tell them it's okay. That's part of the process, it's part of the learning process, it's part of the growth process and you'll be a better person and you'll be a better leader having experienced that. And so, so back to the students, you, if you watch the entire film, and I, I love it if everybody does, there is an episode of extreme failure. Um, but um, the film, so I, I originated this and funded it. Um, Greg Whiteley directed it, did an amazing job. We were in Sundance uh, uh, in January. We've been in 20 major film festivals, but the whole point was not just to produce a film, but to enable people in schools and around schools to innovate, to make changes, to get permission to do that. And so we've been doing both. It's not available online. Uh, if people here want to see it, we can work out something. I'll send you an online screener. But, but I turned down Netflix. We're just doing community screenings. We're getting 200 schools a week now requesting to see it. And then we're going state to state to state. I've been to 30 states already this year. And one state I went to was North Dakota. I went to Fargo. And this next segment will show you the kind of impact I think this film has or has the potential to have in a community that's concerned and worried about its schools. The school system that I went to in the 20th century worked fine for me, but it did not work fine for everyone. Do you think that your high school prepared you for college? Oh, God, no. Did they prepare you for the real world? No. They'll teach you how to produce an A on a report card, but they're not going to teach you how to learn. I absolutely believe we must reimagine school. Success means that they will be able to leave our K-12 system with an understanding of how learning is a lifelong journey. My phone began blowing up with text messages and emails from superintendents and principals. You must see this film. It will transform our students' lives in North Dakota. You have to see this. Right now, we are attempting to educate a generation of kids who will work in jobs that have not been invented yet. What can we do? to engage and inspire our teachers and our students in the school experience because kids that are really interested and motivated, they go 50 to 100 miles an hour. And kids that are bored to tears that have to be pushed through the material, they go one to one and a half miles an hour. How do we set up not only the right conditions for our students, but how do we as a community broadly come together to set up the right conditions for our teachers? He gave us an occasion to get 500 people in this theater and get excited and inspired about learning, so thank you. Last night, we started to come together and have some common language, common understandings, and I think this helps fan our flame. This film was the beginning of some continuing conversation. What I'm most proud of during my time as a state superintendent and my time as an educator in North Dakota is the fact that we're recognizing that students learn in different ways, that the traditional model of education is not the model that's going to carry our students into their future. They're not just learning by reading or they're not just learning by hearing. And most often, most students learn by doing. It's been a very Carnegie unit-based educational system. Already in the last two years since I took office, we are providing opportunities for our school districts to do away with the Carnegie unit, to be innovative. And they can break down a model and have an innovative school system that is only possible in charter schools in other states. I am so impressed. I'm learning about velociraptors. I'm learning about cheetahs, the fastest things now. They're working on Genius Hour projects right now. Genius Hour is based on Google's 20% policy, so they all are getting to study something that they're interested in. The beauty of Genius Hour is that it allows me to really step out of the way. At the end of the project, they will all be teachers because they're all going to teach all of us something that they learned. When you give your kids choice and you let them be responsible for their learning, test scores go up, engagement goes up, motivation goes up. So putting them in real-world situations where they're going to fail 
and, and that's okay. That's actually a good thing that we embrace and, and we talk about that and it's a different mindset, but really important for these kids that when they leave. Our students don't sit down at their future jobs and do 50 minutes of writing, 50 minutes of math, 50 minutes of English. They incorporate all of those skills and all of those knowledge sets into one project. That's what we're doing in education right now and that's what we need to do more of. I'm very excited about our opportunities in North Dakota and there's a growing critical mass of people that believe that we do need to change the model of education and my hope and my goal in five years is to have at least five of our major high schools operating in a project-based school system. The barriers are tradition. You have a system that has been in place for centuries and the results have been okay. There is a risk and a fear that if we change, we don't know what the end result will be. So films like this that really show the success and the result in a tangible, concrete manner breaks down those fears, it breaks down those barriers, and it allows them to say, that's what I want for my student, that's what I want for my child, that's what I want for my state.